it's going to be the tree trunk to a large oak tree, which and um, it's going to be a tree with a herd of cows underneath it. And they have to make the trunk on the potter's wheel and then build all the branches on when it's partly dry. I've made such a variety of things. It's uh, <laughs> It, it's, it's curious because people like different things and you can never tell which are going to be most popular. It depends on the people themselves and, and the mood and where they're shown off. And... But I mean the trees, I've made so many trees in varying forms and they've certainly, they've certainly been popular. Well, I've always been absolutely fascinated by trees and loved them and Again, I can't remember what made me do the first one, but I did a fruit tree with very large live apples on it. It really made you, want to, made you feel you wanted to pick them and eat them. It's got to dry for a day, approximately a day. So um, that'll be overnight. And then when it's what's called leather hard, a sort of cheesy state, then, then one can build on the branches. The clay's firm enough to be able to stand more weight. Finish the roots now, so I'll turn it over just sponge over that area I've finished modelling down there. But I've always worked from my memory in, straight into the clay. I've got quite a good memory and if I just keep that in my mind and transfer it into the clay from the thing I've seen it, it seems to work quite well. I decided that I was going to be you know, a well-known painter. It's ridiculous really but when I was about 14 I decided that was the thing I was going to be really good at and then my art teacher at school sent me to Salford Technical College, which is outside Manchester. A little tiny art school, and, and, and my art teacher's husband was the pottery teacher there, and he was a brilliant teacher. The moment I put my hands on clay, I, I loved, it, loved it. And he was particularly good, so, so he encouraged me, and I, I, well, I got, got so engrossed in it. I, you know, I decided that would be the way I'd earn my living. I started, I, you know, even in the first few months, I decided I was going to have a studio of pottery. Never had any second thoughts about it. <laughs> and absolutely love it. Because uh, working on my own, one tends to get introspective and one doesn't see enough of people. And it makes it a two way thing. Life's very sort of full of contradictions because I hate being on my own. And yet, I obviously love potting enough to go on doing it on my own. And, and, and almost every week, I think now, I'm a, I'll do something else. I'll, I'll take up <laughs> something else, and I don't. Well, I put the props in because I had more and more smaller branches. It gets very heavy, and the whole thing would collapse. When I started, when I was at college, I made a lot of figures and a lot of decorative pieces. But then when I started as a studio potter, I, I turned over to much more domestic wear, just simply so I could make a living. Because at that time, it was harder to sell decorative pieces. And then as the, as the years have gone by, I've made more and more of, more of the decorative things again and then come back to that. So I don't think my style's changed radically. I think it's just developed. My rhythm is, is sort of all go or all stop. So I work not very long hours, but with great intensity. I'm extraordinarily clumsy and I break, I break things continually and I 
build things and I'm carrying cups of tea and people are amazed. I think I'm amazed at myself ever being able to complete anything. And, and, and I, you know, I'm, and I'm, a, I'm a messer. And yet, perhaps to sort of compensate for that, I, I, I am very orderly. I have to be very orderly. I make this terrible mess when I'm working. But every day I mop the whole floor and clean my overalls. <laughs> Go from one extreme to the other. To make a tree from beginning to end, including the animals, takes about two and a half days. That's including all the processes. I'm going to make some cows now. I'm going to do one I've already made. You can see the finished thing. And I'm going to throw the body and, and neck part on the potter's wheel as a little bottle form. I always do these on the potter's wheel because it, it sets me off with a, a hollow form. And otherwise they have to be hollowed out anyway because you can't fire a very solid piece of clay. It won't dry out properly. This is actually this is how I make I'm making fruit for a fruit tree, pears or apples or sheep. I always make all the all the parts like this. Seem, often seem delighted. It seems to have a. Uh, it must have something that. Oh, I don't. It's terribly difficult to describe what to say how, how people react. But they seem to react in a very enthusiastic manner. Very enthusiastic. You know, it's really lovely. And then people who live with them say it brings a bit of. It brings a sort of freshness into the room. And, and they they say they seem to. My trees and things. They seem to have a life about them and stay alive in a way. A woman actually said the other day that it sort of always lives for her and she has a light on it, she changes the angle of the light and it sort of almost changes the sort of atmosphere around it. So I think people enjoy them. If people enjoy what I'm making, that's the main thing, really. I made a very large piece recently and didn't let it dry quite enough and it shattered into hundreds of bits. When I opened the kiln door, it was just a heap of pieces. So that doesn't happen very often now, but it does occasionally. It really needs to dry out for two or three weeks, a big piece of work, until all the moisture's off that. And then, it, then it's biscuit fired, which is a firing... You harden the clay. You have to harden the clay before you glaze it. And then the clay will turn a, a red colour, a terracotta colour. Terribly nerve-wracking. I mean, it, it's extraordinary, because clay needs managing with such... You've got to be very humble, really. You've got to really care for it all along the way, and particularly in the firings, checking it all the time. I'm pouring oxide on the biscuit, biscuited tree first, and that's the basic brown colour. That's a blacky brown colour. Actually, the, the clay doesn't harm your hands at all, and the oxides and glazes dry them up terribly. After I've had a glazing week, all my nails are broken. with all the smaller things, I can just dip them and I don't think there's not such a, a mess created.
People often ask me how I get the animals to look anatomically right, mm -hmm. really sheep-like or cow-like. This I don't really know. I know that I'm very observant and it tends to be intuitive. With the cows, I'm going to put a blob of wax on their forehead so that we get a white star there. It'll resist the next glaze because I'm going to dip, dip the head in a, a darkish brown glaze and the tail, so we get the cows being brown and white, sort of Ayrshire. Why Ayrshire? Well, I feel like that today. <laughs> Sometimes it's free and it's black and white. Well, when this has been fired, it'll come out a bright yellowy green, a sort of spring green. I like bright colours and um, colours that ring, but uh, no, that again varies from, from sort of year to year and time to time. And I start doing autumn trees when it comes along to autumn sometimes, you know, if I'm feeling depressed, perhaps I'll do a spring tree in the winter, you know, <laughs> according to one's mood. I'm going to rub away some of the white glaze with a brush so that the black will show through more clearly. And when the oxide shows through, it gives the impression of bark. The glazed tree will be in the kiln firing for 12 hours, and I do it overnight. And then the following morning, I have to keep an eye on it, a very careful eye, and I have to look through the spy hole. And then it has a, another day cooling, so you reach such a high temperature. So I won't unpack it that day, I'll do it the following day. Mm, what is the question I get asked most about my work? That's quite difficult to decide. Um, how do I make it? How do I colour it? Yes, people are particularly fascinated with the glazes and the colour. Because most pottery, most English studio pottery, is stoneware, and stoneware tends to be soft greys and browns. And they are fascinated by, by it being so, yes, using such a lot of colour. <laughs>